tomorrow. It starts in June. Oh, thank you. I was all excited about it. Thank you very much. Well, I think it's sent out now so that if you want to sell something, you can get on the vendor site. All right. Okay. I'm just making some. Chrissy, it doesn't look like we have a quorum yet. Is that true? I can't remember. That? Oh, we do. One, two, three, five. We do. Um, we're going out on a tour. Oh. I might have talked over you. Can you repeat that? So we are just uh, waiting for Supervisor Fennel. Oh, okay. So I my private find... business is my, my private business is operated uh, exclusively over the internet that we not we don't have any offices we all work from our homes and that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years <laughs> so this is just normal for me You know, I have a random question for anybody that might know the answer. On my screen, on my iPad, I've got four pictures on the bottom. It's me, Mike Johnson, Michael Winkler, and Sue Strahan. And I don't pick them. Somebody's picking these pictures for me. I hear other people talk, but the pictures never switch around. <laughs> it's so strange. I think, it's, how much I I think part of it is your screen size, because I've got... Yeah everybody on mine but mine are at the top and and i've used my ipad before and i thought they were on top on that so it might just be how oh i found it on the left thank, yeah. thank you mike i found it on the left it said uh, it looks a bunch of boxes together and i tried it and i'm good thank you okay. yeah that's right that, that's gallery view right yeah. there that you're, yeah. yeah that one that i'm afraid to right. touch anything when i'm on this because sometimes I, it goes away yeah, well, if yeah. you do, if you do um, speaker, for instance, the person who's speaking comes up and they're the only one and then the strip. But if you do gallery view, you get to see everybody all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I wasn't courageous enough to just try that. Estelle's um, becoming an old hat at this. You're like, oh, hey, my God. <laughs> I don't know how many meetings we've had of these things at this point. So are we, uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I know. We do have a quorum. Okay, wonderful. Woohoo! Great. So, um, I'll, uh, I'm going to do a teensy bit of homework here, but I think I'll just kick it off and I can do my homework uh, as well. Uh, so, I would like to say to everybody, whoops, I guess it's gone. Oh, no, there it is. See, um, even for us doing it all the time, it still tricks us. So I would like to welcome everybody to the um, this very special meeting of the Humboldt County Association of Governments. It's uh, subsequent to um, Executive Order 29, N29-20, the Humboldt County Association of Governments uh, meetings will be held virtually uh, now until further notice. So you can view the meeting through Access Humble website at accesshumble.net. Uh, you can also see it on the Suddenlink channels 10, 11, and 12, or Access Humble YouTube channel uh, at YouTube, and then the user is Access Humble. Um, when you're, if you're uh, joining the meeting and you want to make comments, uh, once uh, an agenda item is open, you can press star nine and uh, then you will be put into queue for speaking with us. And um, that should work pretty well. If you have any problems, please let us know. We've also allowed for comment by email. And in this particular setting, if you have another comment that you want to send in during the meeting, you can send one to um, Debbie, debbie.egger at hcog.net. That's D-E-B-B-I-E. Dot egger at hcog.net. Um, in the meantime, again, uh, thank you everybody for making it through all of these meetings. And uh, with that, 
I would like to call the meeting of the uh, May 21 meeting of HCOG to order. And I'll ask Christy, I think, to uh, do the roll call or I'm yes. not sure who's going to do it. Okay, good. Just... Hi, Christy. Hi. Okay. Council Member Smith. Mayor Seaman. Here. Council Member Stroud. Here. Mayor Jones. Here. Mayor Winkler. Here. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member West. Here. Supervisor Fennell. Here. Council, Council Member Patino. Here. Mr. Tucker. Here. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, with that, uh, we'll go and uh, adjourn as HCOG and convene as the Policy Advisory Committee. Uh, the PAC convenes to include representation from Caltrans and Humble Transit Authority for issues having to do with transportation. And uh, the next item on our agenda is public participation uh, on items that are not on the agenda. So if anybody's got an item that they would like to talk about that is not on today's agenda, now is the time to speak. And again, I will remind you that you press star nine to get into the queue for speaking, or you can go there. And, um, and uh, we will get you on there. The other thing I would remind you is that these meetings can wear on people for a while. So I'm going to um, limit the uh, amount of time for public comment on any item to three minutes. And I'll keep a uh, an eye on that. So with that, do we have any public comment? I don't know, Have you? are you keeping an eye on that, Christy? Yes, we do have one public comment. Thank you. Uh, Estelle, Estelle, it's Ken Sawatsky. Uh, I do wish to make public comment uh, on a transportation related, uh, related item. Uh, I will making, be making specific comments on one of your last agenda items, but I wanted to talk to you about an overall taxpayers league attitude and a little bit of history as far as what we felt as far as transportation tax measures. And uh, again, not specifically on the one that is agendized, but in general. In the past, we have uh, come out against, or myself has come out against uh, certain tax uh, transportation related items. And the reason being we've come out against them because they seem to be more, um, seem to be going as far as you can and we're, didn't have specificity. But our overall policy regarding anything related to a transportation related tax item is that we're looking forward to work with people. And uh, although we did have objections to other ones, uh, there's, a, there's a whole different attitude, which I will reflect a little bit later. So I just wish to announce that. And I also like to say that people perceive the Taxpayers League doesn't make a big difference sometimes in uh, what's happening. But a lot of times it's just two and a half percent or five percent one way or another on a tax issue, such as uh, ones that haven't passed in before. So uh, we, do, we do feel we have a little bit of say because we do write either opposition or for something. And we look forward to working with you on all kinds of transportation items regarding taxes or specific projects in the future. Thank you for uh, me able to wear my Humboldt County Taxpayers League hat for a little bit here. Thank you, Mr. Swatsky. Any further uh, comment on items not on the agenda? Supervisor, we do have one additional comment. Thank you, Christy. Uh, welcome caller. Hello, you are on. Christy, can you see if that person is unmuted? It looks like they are. Is that somebody with the number of uh, 5603 at the end? Oh, yep, that's me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Please. thank you. Um, sorry, I'm not hearing it through the phone. So this is Colin oh. Fisk. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Coalition for Responsible Transportation Priorities. And um, I wanted to just briefly say, um, I've, been, I've been in touch with a number of the jurisdictions that are members of HCOG, but not all of them, regarding um, 
measures that can be taken uh, in this uh, pandemic time to make the streets safer for pedestrians and cyclists as we have more people doing that. Um, and uh, I just I wanted to encourage any of you who um, aren't familiar with some of those measures that are being taken by communities around the country to check out um, the National Association of City Transportation Officials um, website. They have a COVID-19 response um, uh, listing that, that you can check out. There's a number of other organizations and agencies that have um, are, are compiling those responses as well. And one newish one that I wanted to draw to everyone's attention um, is the idea of temporarily relaxing parking standards around restaurants and other businesses to allow um, to allow them to serve customers outdoors and thus allow more more spacing and more um, uh, a higher customer base to allow businesses to hopefully survive this um, since we understand that particularly restaurants probably wouldn't have a big enough customer base for dine-in service when we get to that point um, if they uh, if they only serve indoors with proper social distancing. So uh, I hope that you'll check those things out and consider them for your various jurisdictions. Thanks. Thank you, Colin. Um, any further comment on items out on the agenda, Christy? No further comments. Thank you very much. That will bring us back to the board and um, our next item on the agenda is approval of the me meeting their minutes from their March 19th meeting. Um, I trust everybody's had a look at them and does anybody have any questions from the, on those minutes? Okay. I'll make, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. A motion uh, made by? Paul oh, Patino. And then. And uh, did Susan, Mary <laughs> Seaman did? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So as with all of these uh, Zoom meetings, first of all, I'd like to um, call for public comment on this item. I don't believe there will be, but just in case, is there any public comment on the minutes of the past meeting? Christy? Okay. Council Member Smith? Oh, say, uh, Christy, just uh, just so everybody knows, as with all of the uh, items on the agenda, uh, every I, uh, every vote is a roll call vote. Sorry, go ahead, Christy. Thank you, Council Member Smith. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Thank you, Mayor Simmons. Hi, still. <laughs> Council Member Strand. Yes. Mayor Jones? Yes. Mayor Winkler? Aye. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember West? Yes. Supervisor Fennell? Yes. Councilmember Patino? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, that will bring us to our next item. And this is the consent calendar. Uh, we have, let's see, four items on the consent calendar. Um, uh, does anybody wish to discuss any of them or move them from the consent calendar? No, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion to accept the recommendation that, that the PAC accept the consent calendar. Second that. We have a motion and a second. Any public comment on our consent calendar? And again, I'll remind people to press star nine if they wish to address any of these items. Christy, do we have anyone who wish to speak on the consent calendar? We do not. Thank you, Christy. So let's go to a roll call. Uh, and I'll go back to Christy. Okay. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Mayor Seaman? Aye. Councilmember Strand? Yes. Mayor Jones? Yes. 
Mayor Winkler. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Yes. Council Member West. Yes. Supervisor Fennell. Yes. Council Member Patino. Yes. Mr. Tucker. Mr. Tucker. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, um, everybody. Um, so moving right along, now we're going into our action items. And the first item is the local transportation fund apportionment. And uh, we'll have uh, Director Clem, Marcella, are you there? Yes, I am here. Thank you very much. I'll just start by saying that normally the local transportation fund apportionment is a routine and non-controversial item. We are not in normal times, as everyone knows. Um, but I will say this is uh, should not be considered non-controversial, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to put it on as an action. A large part of uh, HCOG's budget comes from the local transportation fund. This year, we're requesting $400,000. It's $50,000 less from last year. And because I'm um, on that subject, I just wanted to uh, say that the first table in your staff report um, does show the comparison of this year's request to last year. So this year we're requesting, requesting 50,000 less. The, in the difference column, it should be in parentheses. So the total amount um, at the bottom and in the difference column should be $165,648,000 less than last year. I'll give everyone a little bit of time to, to look at that. It, I just caught that before the meeting. Okay. Um, so about $200,000 uh, for the fiscal year of 2021, um, there's a less of an ask of $200,000 than our current fiscal year. In terms of HCOG's budget, um, with respect to the local transportation fund, HCOG will not see a hit because the Transportation Development Act law has priorities on who gets paid first, and HCOG, as well as the county auditor, are at the top. So when the funding comes in in, in July, we get that first hit at, at those funds. After that, it goes through different categories of transit. Um, and then after transit, um, there are contracted transit agencies that get funded. Then after that, funds can go to bicycle and pedestrian uses for each jurisdiction. Uh, this year, our uh, income is pretty much in line with 1819. I was surprised to see that. We are, um, uh, you know, maybe maybe ten thousand dollars less than what we saw last year, uh, as of May. So that is also good news. The issue uh, for your agencies, though, is that uh, the county auditor every year estimates how much they think will come in, and they've est they estimated high for this current year. So they mis estimated over two hundred thousand dollars more, or around two hundred thousand dollars more than actually came in. We foresee that all transit will be paid for, um, but we'll, what we will see a shortfall in is the money that goes to streets and roads for your agencies. Next month, I hopefully will have a better uh, estimate for a final estimate. The state um, um, submits their payment to the county auditor uh, around the 20th of every, of every month. Uh, it came in on the 19th, so that was exciting uh, that I could get that information. In terms of the revenues that came in in April of this year com compared to April of last year, there was a 7% decrease. And in May, 11% uh, decrease. And that, that, that sounds bad, but I was expecting worse um, because uh, the local transportation fund is a sales tax fund. So um, we, will, we just have to wait and see what will happen next month. In terms of HCOG's uh, additional funding that comes through for our budget, we have the rural planning assistance that comes through Caltrans. It is for planning, transit or transportation planning. We have not heard from headquarters that there will be a decrease. So we've received three hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars annually. In a statewide meeting a couple of weeks ago, we did we heard that that's what we should expect. So we're not going to get a hit on that. And then the last uh, big. Uh, um, funding is called the planning and programming and monitoring funding and that's uh, allocated through the California Transportation Commission. In times when transportation funding is short, which we've seen in the past, the California Transportation Commission puts these PPM monies at the top of the allocation list. 
So again, we do not see a reduction in those funds coming to HCOG. So that is the good news for us that we um, aren't gonna see a big hit with COVID. Uh, but again, your, uh, your governments that do use local transportation funds on streets and roads will probably see less coming in, not only this year, but potentially next year. And um, with that, I can answer any questions you have um, for anyone that's not familiar with this process, um, but it's, I think it's been going on since 1973 or so. <laughs> that I can answer any questions. So um, let me just jump in here very quickly. What I like to do uh, as chair is not to have you use the Zoom hand raise, but to actually raise your hand so I can see it because I'm looking at everybody. So um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay, uh, uh, Councilman Johnson. Well, uh, I know that there's per gallon taxes and per dollar taxes when it comes to gasoline. There, some of it's an excise tax on the per gallon unit and some of it is a sales tax on the cumulative price of a gallon of gasoline. And I was just wanting clarification on which these funds or any of the gas tax funds that make it this far come out of. Yeah, so the local transportation fund is a quarter cent of the sales tax. So okay. not, not related to the gasoline or the diesel. In our consent calendar, we did have an item for the state transit assistance funding, the STA funding. That is a sales tax on diesel. And what I've heard from the state so far is that truck drivers kept trucking. <laughs> so, um, you know, they did put in those miles, but the uh, cost went down. So diesel got cheaper. Um, they didn't have a number for us yet. Uh, and annually, the uh, state controller's office submits a revised estimate for this STA funding, the state transit assistance funding in August. At that time, we'll look and see if there's a big hit. We will look at our reserves to see if we have funding to supplement that hit. And if we need to change our resolution that was passed in the consent calendar, we will certainly bring that back to you after uh, consulting with the transit agencies. Okay, uh, we had a League of California Cities webinar today on looking ahead fiscally. And one of the things that was surprising was that the gas tax have, is, even though they sold less gasoline, there was a small increase because it was a, uh, because of the sales tax and the bunch of things working at it. So that there's still gonna be a small increase even with lower price per gallon. And I'm, because of the excise tax portion of it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that good news, uh, uh, Councilman Ruth Johnson. Um, when I, yes, okay, uh, Councilman uh, Member Patino, you're next. Thank you. Um, uh, Marcella, you know, when you were talking about that, we're gonna, there's gonna be a $50,000 uh, difference. That was on page two in the HCOG administration and planning. The first table, not the figure, but the table that shows the fiscal year 2021 estimate. Next to it is the 2019 estimate and the next is the difference. Right. Difference, 50,000 should have parentheses around it. And then total at the bottom should have been 168. Yeah. And that's just saying we're asking less this coming year as the current year. Yeah, mine is kind of written a little bit different. So I, I see the 50,000, I don't see the 165. Um, that's because it, it, at the bottom it says 115 and it, yeah. because that 50 was in a parentheses, it wasn't added to that amount at the bottom. Okay. So instead of $115,000 less, it should be 168, $65,000 less. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I apologize for that. That's all right, I have a different format, thank you. Any uh, other questions or comments from the board? No, okay. Um, I'll bring it, I'll take it to the public. Is there any public comment on this item? And again, we'd remind you to press star nine and you'll be put in the queue. And uh, again, I'm restricting input to three minutes. Uh, Christy, do we have any 
a public comment on this item? We do not. Thank you. Uh, that will bring us back to the board. And so uh, we do have a recommended action and uh, entertain a motion or more discussion, whatever we would like. I move that the PAC recommend that the HCOG board adopt resolution 20-07 approving the fiscal year 2020 to 21 local transportation fund apportionment. Second. Thank you, Mayor Jones. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Um, all right, let's go to Christy and she will take a roll call. Council Member Smith. Aye. Mayor Seaman? Yes. Council Member Strang? Yes. Mayor Jones? Yes. Mayor Winkler? Aye. Council Member Johnson? Yes. Council Member West? Yes. Supervisor Fennell? Yes. Council Member Patino? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Well, thank you, Christy. That's passed unanimously again. And now we go on to our next action item. And this is the Social Services Transportation Advisory Council and Service Coordination Committee consolidation. And I'm going back to Marcella. Here I am. So this yeah. item was at the request of members, about four members who are on both committees. <laughs> um, we uh, ran the idea, passed both the Service Transportation Advisory Council and the Transportation Committee, both unanim unanimously uh, recommended approval. So it's before you today uh, to get your um, okay on consolidating these two committees. With your approval of that, we will come back in August with revised bylaws. Um, at that time, we'll have an opportunity for everyone to meet, go over the bylaws to discuss, um, you know, the meeting times. Because right now, one group meets meets quarterly, one group meets every two months. So we'll work out those things um, and um, get the membership correct. We do have some members of the service coordination committee from uh, Humboldt State University and from College of the Redwoods who have not been attending. So we will reach out to those members to um, encourage them to attend. And if for some reason they want to uh, not be part of HCOG subcommittees, we will let you know what, what they say on that. And with that, I can answer any questions. Any questions on this item from the board? Okay, um, I will put it out to um, public comment. Any public comment on this item? Oh, um, Mayor Jones. Yes, go ahead. You do have to uh, unmute. There you go. There you are. You may speak. <laughs> I was just wondering why Debbie and Marcella and Una and I haven't I can't see them on this, so I had to call my tech person. I will speak for myself. I have a cheap computer that I use. It's my work computer. It's a laptop that I use when I travel. So it's light and small and inexpensive. It does not have a camera. Okay. <laughs> I think everyone Thank you. could be shy. <laughs> I'll let them speak for themselves. And if you, and I'm sure that your tech person um, told you that if you bring your cursor up, onto the window, you will actually see everybody's name, even in those black boxes. Yes, uh, I do see I do see their names. I just did, now I see Una. I lost Michael for a while, but now I see him. Okay. It's, it's um because I turned my video off. I don't always have great broadband. And um, then I also figure you can give your attention to the speaker instead of my back background. <laughs> but I will turn on for my item, which is coming up, I turn on my video. I see. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So again, uh, let's go back. Uh, is there any public comment on uh, this uh, second social, the second action item, the social service transportation advisory? 
There's no public comment. Thank you, Christy. With that, um, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move. Um, where is it? Uh, I will move to approve the consolidation of the Service Coordination Committee and the Social Service Transportation Advisory Council. I'll second that. Thank you both. And I'll have Christy do the roll call. Council Member Smith. Aye. Mayor Seema. Yes. Council Member Strand. Yes. Mayor Jones. Yes. Mayor Winkler. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Yes. Council Member West. Jack. Yes. Thank you. Supervisor Fennell. Yes. Council Member Patino. Yes. Mr. Tucker. Yes. Thank you. It's unanimous. All right. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, that brings us to our next uh, action item, and it's a mobility on demand strategic development plan. And um, I will toss that over to Una. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Christy, could you let me share screen, please? So today, um, what is brand new for you? Um, the biggest thing is the new technical memo from our consultants that goes over potential pilot projects. And this is a culmination of the last few technical memos that they have. Uh, delivered to us, which the community at large has already had a chance to see um, through a couple workshops and the committees that we have, Technical Advisory Committee, the SSTAC and the SCC. And those were the um, technical memos that summarized existing conditions and existing unmet needs that we know from the communities as per their transit and mobility transportation needs. It also, one of them gave results from um, the surveys that we put out. If, if you recall, it was quite a while ago, but we had some um, online surveys as well as paper surveys. And um, then the consultants did some research based on our community's um, existing conditions and needs and tried to find what innovative mobility on demand types of new technologies would fit in our rural areas. So, um, so Una? I will, yeah. Oh, sorry. Had, had you already started your, your sharing your screen because it's not visible? I'm, I'm not. I'm still disabled from oh. sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. I see you, Una. Okay, I'm going to try and I was just going to scroll through the um, pilot project technical memo. Um, but it's, it's your screen okay, is there not it is. there it is. I just got okay, let me pull it up. Please bear Here with me. Go. Yep, no problem. Okay. Great. So nothing fancy here. I'm just uh, gonna highlight or speak about the things I highlighted um, just as the framework for the mobility on demand technologies that we thought were most viable for our communities at this time. Uh, we based it on these four guiding principles, which were that what our, our main objective, objectives are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, increase transit effectiveness, also contribute to our regional economic development, and have equitable access. So we're trying to hit as high a bar for all of those that we could with whatever mobility on demand um, projects we search for in the, in the future or proceed with in the future. And then we um, have some other more detailed evaluation criteria that then we also look at for every potential uh, technology or potential pilot project. And then these evaluation criteria should also um, 
Sorry, I thought I was getting a message. Um, uh, Una, I will, I will say this. Um, we're just seeing your first page where the, uh, do, uh, the file is highlighted in a list, but we're not seeing any other pages. Okay. Uh, it says I am screen not sharing. Uh, maybe my broadband is too slow. It could be. It's just on that very first page with uh, HCOG potential pilots highlighted. As if you were to click on the thing. It's your, it's your okay. Windows Explorer so page, but not the document. Yeah. Okay, so the mess I have a green light that says you are screen sharing. So why don't I just tell you what page I am on? Oh, yeah. But, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely not uh, imperative that 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 you see it this is just straight from um the enclosure yeah. so on the yeah, bottom of page at okay at the bottom of page three um sorry, sorry Una, i really yeah. hate to do this to you no sure but what? since you're since you're not going to share the screen let's take that off please so i can look at it thank you thanks a lot appreciate that okay can i just ask christy if she could go to page three if it works for her if the broadband is better in eureka while una's speaking that might be helpful for everybody. Sorry, Christy. Yeah. And otherwise, just go through your uh, your okay. staff report. It's right there. OK, now I uh, let me pull up my own, because now I can't see mine. <laughs> well, we can we can just follow through on the um, on the staff report. Okay, great. So on the bottom of page three, I just highlighted that there are um, that the opportunities that we went forward with uh, were informed by previously documented unmet transit needs and the input that we got from the community. And then scrolling down to page six, I was, I just wanted to point out right under a 4.0, a way forward, just again to reiterate that the way we informed um, what the community ourselves and what the community wanted, and then where we would go from there, uh, what approach we would take is based on input from the community, and then also to be able to address multiple service types, and then mm -hmm. um, last but not least, to reduce single occupancy vehicle travel, and therefore um, get the benefits uh, both socially and economically and land use based that that would afford us. So the, the, um, th there are two main potential pilot projects that the consultant um, is recommending. And the first is for on-demand transit. And then the second has to do with active transportation, particularly uh, expanding bike share. So I'll briefly summarize the first, the on-demand transit. Um, and this is starts on the bottom of page six. So the main goal of this is to streamline the existing RTS service, which is our very robust intercity service, which also um, it's a pretty long trip if you're going to start at the very top and go to the very end, north, south or south, north. Mm -hmm. And um, what the consultants believe is that if we can shorten that to concentrate more on the service areas where we have high ridership and then find an alternative service for the areas that have low ridership, then um, across the board, it would make transit um, better for all users. So it's a two-pronged approach. Um, but they don't have to necessarily happen simultaneously. And one of those prongs at the top of page, the next page, page seven, uh, starts out that they would eliminate three deviations. And again, not all three of these deviations have to happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, some are much easier than others. Uh, so the deviations would be to Fortuna and to Manila and to the Arcata Eureka Airport. So um, recommending that instead of having the RTS 
serve those places, replace that with an on-demand service to those three areas. So when there was a passenger who wanted a feeder to the uh, trunk RTS, they would be able to use a model very much like Lyft and Uber use, but not necessarily a private company, but they would be able to call up and say, pick me up here, and then they would get a ride to get on the main RTS um, line. And if that were to happen, um, the RTS would save enough time that we believe they would be able to re, um, run more frequent buses on the trunk line that remains. Okay, so. Um, Can I and, ask a question about that? Yes, please. Uh, Una. So I, I'm looking at the numbers and, you know, it says that there isn't that much use and that's why the on-demand uh, service would be um, more appropriate. Um, I've heard this complaint from people who use the on-demand um, that then their, their, their the stops are less. In other words, you know, it's not going to keep stopping at the places that they're used to it stopping at. Is there any kind of consideration of that or is that just something we'll hear about when this comes out for the public? Now for the less stops on the, mm -hmm. the bus, is that what people yeah. have? Yeah, 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 right. Oh, so you're saying using Uber or Lyft, so then basically they can, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, so, so yeah. Um, for example, someone in Manila would be able to get a ride to yeah. Eureka and be able to get on RTS at a yeah. remaining stop at Eureka. Yeah. And it would be Uber or Lyft rather than just a man. Uh, yeah, I got it. It would be a service like it might even be a service that HTA, in fact, runs, but um, it would not be the fixed route big bus. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Oh, oh. Um, uh, yeah, Mayor Winkler. Um, uh, Una, have you compared, have you done any cost comparison between these uh, on-demand vehicles being owned by um, by a public agency versus just contracting with private companies to provide the service? Right now, the costs that they provided us were just based on what is um, our are um, more or less our posted local taxi providers. And then also what City Ambulance is providing us based on our pilot project on Old Arcata Road. Um, but the cost comparison that you ask for will be the next step because first we have to tell them, yes, these are from you, um, these are the pilot projects that we want our strategic development plan to further review. And once they get the okay that they're on the right track, then we get a cost model in the next, in the final, which will, uh, we should be have, we should get delivered to us in a month. Sorry, I just took a drink. Councilman Johnson and then um, Stu, Councilman Strong. Council Women's Strong. So Una, I read the the example of the old Arcata Road, uh, the ore uh, trial, and saw how it worked. A call an hour ahead of time, and you can get a ride to one of the stops at the other end. And so that would be the more or less the model for. Fortuna, Manila, and the airport is the same type of thing? The same type of thing. We would try to be as on demand as, as finances allow. Um, so the pilot with the older Cater Road started with the day in advance, and we think that was a barrier to people using it. So we were able to ramp it up to an hour in advance. And our goal would be to even get to 15 minutes in advance. But other than that small detail, yes, it's the same model based on that pilot. Okay, because I was just thinking the somebody that came in on the airport and then wants to catch the bus to Arcata or Eureka or even Fortuna, 
um, if they had to wait an hour at the airport to catch the yeah. bus. To, so I like the idea of getting it down yeah. to maybe 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And especially like in Fortuna, where they talked about the 100 riders with this fixed mm -hmm. route through Fortuna and to even an hour there to call ahead might become a barrier. So, but yeah. I mean, as with everything, people learn to work around it. But. Yeah, and and sometimes if, if the people are um, getting a feeder to the trunk line, the trunk line might only come every 30 minutes. So the service provider would also have a little bit of um, predicting power when, mm -hmm. when perhaps, you know, ups and downs in demand would be. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes, you know, this north and south route through town is at different times and different coordination. So, but sure. thank you. And um, Council Member Strong. Yes. So I'm concerned about uh, Riedel, Scotia. So could you explain what's, what the process then will be? For just the deviation part, or are you thinking of the other prong where, um, well, I guess that, no, that is the other prong, yes. So yeah. the other prong is um, to have the same kind of service from uh, McKinleyville to Trinidad and then Fortuna. For Tuna South. Um, so it would be the same kind of thing. Someone in Rio Dell who wanted to get to McKinleyville, say, they would call on demand and they would get a ride to the closest RTS service stop. So that would be in um, Fortuna. For, Fortuna. And then they, they would get on the bus there and ride to McKinleyville. So one of the um, cons of this for some riders is instead of a one seat trip, they call it, um, maybe you would have a three seat trip. And and sometimes it is um, less preferable to have transfers, but at the same time, um, it would be a balance with more transfers, but potentially a, a very sh much shorter trip because um, you would have a feeder and then you'd be on the bus and, and then another feeder potentially. And that might take you less time than the current system if you got on RTS and had all these deviations and waited to go for, from example, Rio del de Trinidad. But oh, it's but, only a pilot, so we would have to learn about all of that. So are you saying that the people in Rio del would have to call an Uber to get to Fortuna? Uh, Uber type service. Yeah. That, that, an on-demand, on first mile, last mile, they call it, yeah, a personal mobility on-demand, and it might be a taxi. Like right now, the old Arcata Road pilot, um, they might send out a taxi for you, and that, that would be your feeder. Um, also, if someone wanted to get to Fortuna, um, or if someone wanted to take this and then not get on a bus, at this point, we, we don't have any way of... Um, prohibiting people from do that, doing that in this concept. So, okay. um, we don't have any taxis in Rio Del. Now, is there any, any further, did you want to go further, Sue? No, thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, we have uh, Council Member West and then um, Council Member Patino. If um, a lot of people came in on an airport, they wanted to, and you had a big rush how does that, do you have enough cars to do that? Or how does that work if there's a lot of people at one time? So the with the technology, so this is the best case scenario, um, with the on-demand technology, they would if uh, either see all the, let's call them pings, and send out a bigger shuttle, or send out more cars, or some people would, or it would become first come first serve. They might be able to take the first uh, couple and the, and the other ones might have to wait another 15 minutes or, or who knows. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Patino. 
excuse me. Um, no I had a specific question about uh, McKinleyville and I didn't quite understand where, have you decided where that uh, connection is going to be to the feeder to the airport? No. The, okay. the, de the details we don't have, the concepts we do, and also we have another um, concept pending uh, for for supervisor, um, of course, blanking on his name, McKinleyville Madron. supervisor. Steve Madrone. Supervisor Madrone's um, research and um, work into having having transit in McKinleyville. Yeah, well, th thank you. I, I, for me, uh, the advantage I see as somebody that would fly, I don't have to wait for the bus. I'll be able to catch that feeder and get anywhere, actually. I mean, you, is there a limit to where that feeder goes to? For example, if I'm at the airport and I want to get to Arcata, can I take the feeder to Arcata or do I always have to switch in McKinleyville to catch the main line? That I mean, is is a a limit. Sorry, is there a limit on the feeder? Um, the, the concept for the feeder now is to take a person to the nearest RTS line, bus and, stop. Okay, and that will probably be determined by does it have a shelter? Because you're not going to take them and drop them there in the rain, right? Right. So it would be an existing, um, well, right now, definitely for the pilot, it's probably going to be an existing stop. And um, yes, if there's not a shelter, then we want to put a shelter there. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to get the, the thing in my mind mechanically, because it. I, I really look at it as being positive because... Every time I ride through Manila and one person gets on, and when I come back, one person gets off. Then when I go north to Trinidad, we go into West Haven. I don't know how long that takes. And then most of the time, nobody gets on, nobody gets off. So yeah, I can see this really affecting those stops that take a lot of time that 99% of the riders are never going to use. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, Council Member Johnson. Sorry to ask a second question of Una, but I'm curious if I didn't see all that, some of this in the first time I read through there, but if the Fortuna area is the southern terminus, and you don't want them to go, if they're trying to avoid going into Fortuna and making that route around, that pretty much puts them at Palmer, if I'm not mistaken. Is that is that where they're looking at the, the closest transit stop to be? So um, there would be one stop in Fortuna in this concept, and they're working with HTA, and, and um, HTA will be informing about what would be the best one for the route. Because they, we do have some covered stops at the end street parking area, which mm -hmm. they can pretty much make a U-turn through town or however you want to put it there. Mm -hmm. Or it could be at um, by River Lodge on the River Walk, where you have that's reasonable good. access on and off. Because that's going to be part of your criteria of choice is your access on and off the freeway. So right. All right. Well, that's what I was wondering. And that also affects Council Member Strand's question, too, as to where would the ride service to Fortuna end up? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the discussions have also always been that we want to do the low hanging fruit first. And if this is to um, be tried out in Fortuna, we can't do it without the city of Fortuna. And um, we want to investigate the best possible options for Fortuna Transit if they can expand and, and finding finances to do that. And so one of the concepts that the consultant has brought up is that Fortuna Transit would expand and be able to pick up Rio Dell um, users. 
for example. In a perfect world, that would be the way to go. Yeah, and we are striving for a perfect world. <laughs> um, as Council Member Strawn, on that yeah. item again. Sorry, I am very concerned about our riders here in Rio Dell. We have a lot of people who ride the bus, and even in Scotia. So uh, this is uh, disconcerting to me. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. Well, it brings me back to the, my first sort of, uh, I don't know, fuzzy question. And that is, so let's say you've got people in Rio Del who are used to using the bus. And there's a number of places that they could ride to. This is the thing that I was trying to remember from input I'd gotten down in Southern Humboldt. When you cut off those feeder lines, um, when you, you, you're also cutting off multiple stops in some instances. And people may only want to go that certain distance. Now they've got to go, either they're going to take an Uber or whatever to just go to that, or they've got to go all the way. So is it going to cut out some access for people? No, we, we wouldn't be um, diminishing service. So mm -hmm. if that Southern route was not going to be served by a fixed route, then we would make sure that the new first mile, last mile, or P mod would get those people to where they need to go within, you know, outside of the trunk line for whatever exists today. So they they wouldn't necessarily ever get on a bus then? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. Uh, well, it sounds from the level of interest from Fortuna and Rio Del, if you want to do a pilot project, <laughs> um, it might be a little complicated. Um, yes, Council Member Smith, Mayor Smith, I forget. Um, uh oh. Yes, um, these are cities in Humboldt County. I have to ask. Um, has there been discussion of a feeder to Ferndale, which is a, a large number of elderly people uh, without transportation? Yes, and um, I believe it's in the, the table in this um, technical memo that Ferndale was one of the areas um, definitely in the record for having an unmet transit need. And I believe from the first flush, the um, consultants felt like at this time, the density uh, is too low for demand for right now, a pilot project to be a good candidate there. Well, Ferndale has heard that for the last 30 years. I understand. <laughs> we need to move the city off the floodplain and then we can get bigger. Send <laughs> the word. in the coastal zone then. Watch out. Yeah. Um, Council Member Patino. Well, right now, if you're going to try to get from Ferndale to the main line, there isn't anything. And with this kind of system, there'd be a feeder to get you across the bridge and they can pick you up there. But right now, your city doesn't have any, doesn't provide anything. Fortuna provides somewhat of a feeder. But as I understand it, Ferndale doesn't have a feeder. They're, they will get one with this if it's done. I think. Does that make sense? Uh, Una, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn. If... Um... If the pilot projects are successful and we learn how to do it right and we get a sustainable level of funding, then I could see that definitely coming online. Oh, that would I be mean, it's in our it's in our it's in our sites for sure. Um, the things that are in the strategic development plan, I think for our first try are what the um, consultants just think are the most likely to succeed in the beginning. You know, I had one more thing to say on that. Uh, it, when we're talking about uh, rolling this out and where do you start, low-hanging fruit? I mean, it seems to me that 
the airport or Manila would be probably a better spot to start. Yeah. Since it affects yeah. a lot fewer people. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and with the ridership. And with the ridership and the number of um, buses that go mm -hmm. through right now, and from HTA's recommendations, HTA has said Manila would be the easiest. And also, um, HTA wants to try something that we already have funds available for uh, to do the most sustainable thing right now. And Greg believes under current pre-COVID conditions, we would be able to even try out the Manila pilot without um, getting grant startup funds. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions or comments on this item before I open it up for public comment? Uh, were, were you finished, Juna? Because we actually kind of jumped in on you. And then this no, just that, took that's, off. That, that's fine. That's that's the perfect result. Um, I'll just quickly um, bring up the active transportation, if that um, reminds anyone that they had a question about expanding the possibility of expanding, expanding bike share. And in this technical memo, other than expanding Eureka and Arcata, which actually already have one or more docks, um, they have said um, Fernbridge, McKinleyville, and one other place, uh, Fortuna, that they they would think would be good places to start to have a uh, initial bike share. And then we got a comment um, from the technical advisory committee member in Fortuna. Um, he said he felt that just one bike share dock in Fortuna probably wouldn't be the most successful. So he recommended there, there be at least a couple that you could get around town with. So we're gonna update the, um, the memo also to reflect that. And um, yeah, and, and again, this is a draft memo. We're still looking for more information from the consultants and to get more details to have this, uh, a more robust strategic development plan once we bring it back to you. Yeah, and I, I, speaking of Fortuna, if I might, Councilman Johnson, I mean, I could see three uh, just because of the layout of Fortuna. Um, I don't know, just, but that that's for further discussion, but I definitely don't think one would be enough. Yeah. No, we, we pre COVID, we had two. Um, as we call them, senior buses. They're not just seniors. We'll say paratransit buses operating. And to pick up the other areas, especially if we wanted to also, if, if the HTA or the pilot project or the mobility on demand project required to cover also Ferndale, um, It'd have to be a completely separate bus than the two that are already operating in Fortuna. And I would ask Robin if the bridge is still running in Ferndale. They used to have a van called the bridge that would run into Fortuna or Lolita. Or, I don't know if it went into Eureka or not. So. so I don't know if that's still operating or not. Um, I'm at a place where my uh, laptop says Zoom, and everybody has disappeared. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess if you can hear me, um, as far as I know, the bus that runs is the senior citizen bus, uh, which is basically run by uh, Mary Ann Banson. Um, yeah, the van, a little van pool kind of thing. That's the one. Yep. And I think it. I, maybe they don't have it anymore. But on the side used to be stenciled the bridge, and it was acted as a bridge between Ferndale and Fortuna. Yes, and it, originally it was for doctors' appointments and things like that. But I think it's expanded since then. So it might be. something to think about for the
Thank you, thank you, uh, Robin. I, I think your issue is that uh, I'll go to you in a minute, um, Councilmember Patino. I think your issue is that you may be having a, an unstable connection. Um, yes, I think yeah, so. But, but you'll be, you know, just keep it, move your cursor around. You might just find your window. Um, <laughs> I, I've been doing that still. <laughs> it's now it showers past. Oh. <laughs> Pass, okay. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's go to um, uh, Councilmember Patino. Yeah, um, Una, I wanted to ask you about the Zagster thing. Were you? Did I get that you were thinking about an expansion of the Zagster into McKinleyville, Fortuna, wherever Ferndale? That's what the recommendations are. They have that expanding it, and they have given us um, specific places that they think docks would be best placed first. Oh, great. Thank you. Because uh, it, it seems to be working in Arcata somewhat. And uh, because HSU has their station, and we've got one, and co op or somebody else has one. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's a great discussion so far. Let's uh, hear if anybody from the public would like to comment on this item. And again, I will remind people you uh, press star nine. And um, at that point, uh, you will be in the queue to speak. Do we have any um, input from the public on this item, Christy? No, there is no public comment. Thank you very much. Uh, bring it back to the board. So any suggestions on how to move forward on this item? Any motion? Very so I know you're all looking at your cheat sheets right now. <laughs> yeah, there, there is no, um, no recommended, recommended motion. Yeah. yeah. I, I think for me, uh, talking about direction I, I like everything you're doing and as as uh, choices are made or need to be made then we can get tighter on it as far as where to start to pilot and how to expand the Zagster or whatever so yeah I'm just supportive I think what we got from this if you, as you could see um, a general recognition that maybe the, the part in the north might be your pilot area to begin with, just sent, sent to that. A uh, sense also that there are real concerns about what it would look like in the Rio del Scotia and Fortuna area. Mm -hmm. um, so those kind of things. So yeah, I guess that's kind of input you're getting from that. Yeah. And, and I understand the concerns. Our goal is not to diminish. The entire goal of this project is how can we increase access? So if there is something that um, we can tell is going to diminish access, that is not part of the journey we want to take. Um, if we learn from a pilot like oh okay we misread that which is a little bit what has happened with old arcata road then um we have the benefit of it only being a pilot learning from that and and um readapting well thank you very much for thank you. all your work on this you know thank you very good so that will bring us to the fourth item on um our action section and this is a discussion on a transportation sales tax i'm going to take uh, this back to marcella i think would be the best yeah. person to to bring this forward yes so i just want to begin with stating that it is just absolutely extraordinary that the humboldt taxpayer league called last week to support a ballot measure for sales tax <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I did, uh, and it was, uh, I did receive the call from Kent Sawatsky. I did let him know that, um, I, as this, uh, executive director, wouldn't be supportive and I can go over some of the reasons that I have, but what I stressed to him is that I am not the decision maker of HCOG. So I did get approval from, uh, our, our chair to get this on the agenda for your discussion. 
if you would like uh, staff to uh, devote time and funding to this, I will certainly do it, um, but I do need your direction on it. Just for just a few reasons um, that I have, there's just very little time to get this on the ballot for November. There's a lot of work that should go into uh, a ballot measure, polling, coordination with our technical advisory committee and other partners. There's been no public outreach from HCOG. There should be a, a privately funded campaign for this that is not government. We don't have any of that. We didn't do any of uh, the public outreach. Um, I believe we do have two cities that um, are going to be moving forward for a general sales tax on the member ballot. I'm, I see Susan Seaman. I believe the city of Eureka will. Um, I also believe the city of Trinidad, possibly Riedel. And in the past, when we've had the discussions with the technical advisory committee, the committee has never wanted to compete with a city for the uh, general sales tax because you don't want to turn voters off on saying no to everything, which does happen sometimes when there's too many asks for funding. And then, of course, economic downturn due to COVID-19. I just just doesn't seem right to ask people who have lost their jobs, who have uh, reduced income to pay more sales tax. Now, I will say that Kent's ideas um, of the changes compared to what we did in 2016 to focus on potholes and culverts and fix it first issues, I, I believe is supportive. But again, the technical advisory committee hasn't uh, discussed this, the public hasn't discussed this. And I would, if uh, the uh, board allows, allow Kent Zawatsky to call in, hopefully. He told me he'd be in on this call. He was here in the beginning. I hope he's still there. Um, for him to, to have his say. You can say don't know that, no to that, of course, but <laughs> <laughs> my recommendation, and I can certainly answer any questions. If you do uh, direct staff to spend time on this, we will have to add something to our overall work program for next year. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that it's always been the highest recommendation that if you are going for a sales tax initiative, it should be during the presidential election. Um, so Potentially, we could go in a 2024, um, but again, that is the HCOG board's decision to direct me to spend funding. And with that, um, I don't see Kent calling in. Christy? Um, so call? Marcella, uh, this is Estelle. Um, so I think what we'll do right now is I believe Kent is probably on the line and uh, I would like to hear from him again, as I said to him, uh, we don't, you know, and with an offer like that, we want to hear it. We want to discuss it amongst us and then make, uh, you know, an informed decision. So Kent, are you there? Yes, I, I believe I've been unmuted. Uh, star nine didn't do it, star six did. And so and, uh, I, I, really, I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to address this with you folks. Uh, mm -hmm. Marcel and I will have to agree to disagree. I don't want to wait four years for the tax. I'm extremely optimistic. I'll be quite honest with you. I blocked this whole process before. Uh, in other words, when I called the people that would normally donate to a tax like this, being the people, the beneficiaries, such as the major contractors, I said, I think you're wasting your time. I don't like the way this tax is. They didn't play, did they? Well, this time I'm going to be doing the opposite. I'll be reaching out to all of them. I've already re reached out to Jeff Hunterlock with the uh, operating engineers. And I think I've crafted this in a manner that everybody will feel is acceptable. And in certain times, you just kind of have to buck the thing. And I wish to partner with you folks and have your staff spend the time. I would be extremely disappointed and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and just totally puzzled that the Taxpayers League can't help work with you and pass this tax. So I'm going to quickly read to you the measure that I wish to think be put on the ballot. And uh, some of you have already heard this. So I call it Measure AAA. It's a AAA rated tax because the Taxpayers League thinks it's great. Okay, to supplement existing funding for maintenance, rehabilitation, and construction of existing transportation, including potholes, culverts, micro paving, chip and seal. Uh, for local match, local match leveraging of state federal funds for road infrastructure. And the question is, shall the Humboldt County voters adopt an ordinance 
establishing a quarter cent per dollar sales tax throughout Humboldt County for 10 years, raising approximately $5 million annually, requiring independent audits, separate accounts, public oversight, and local revenue control. A minimum of 90% going to local contractors when possible through a competitive bid process. Uh, so I, I run this by uh, people. So uh, I think that your time for your for your staff would not be anywhere near as extreme as before because I've gone through the whole measure. And if, if I'm allowed to work for Marcella, it's kind of a cut and paste with the same measure you measure we had, just filling in the right numbers. Now, there may be some new regulations she has to research. She mentioned that to me. But I think we can do this and adapt it. And I think we can move quite quickly. Now, I wanted to get on to one more thing here with my limited time. In, in your prior uh, Humboldt County Transportation Ballot Measure Expenditure Plan, and this is something that I think you should request uh, be mailed to you uh, before you make a decision, and uh, or, or you hopefully you'll make a decision now. It, you already agreed how to split up the pie, and I would use your existing splitting of the pie with one exception, and I've talked to uh, both Tom Madsen and, and, uh, and Susan Seaman regarding this. In the splitting of the pie before, Eureka only got 32.57%. The county got 42.89%, especially considering that they put so much money in tax things into uh, Measure Z and O, and in my opinion, get very little back. Put those two numbers together. Everybody else stays the same. Split that baby in half so they both get 37.73% of the pie. The rest of you would stay the same. Everything else would be prorated the same as far as a quarter cent sales tax rather than a half. And I, I would ask you to, to kind of um, uh, trust me. I'm from the Humboldt County Taxpayers League, not from the government, and I want to help with this. So I think during this time, it's time to be bold. I'm willing to invest a lot of my time and effort in putting the coalition together to support this, both financially and go to the public forums. You know I go to a lot of those and, uh, and, and help promote this along with other people that I think are willing to participate. So uh, consider this, please. I, I appreciate you even considering it. I would recommend that you bring, have staff bring back some pertinent information, including an update of the Measure U and with a few changes. And I, I think that the minimal, minimal time, hopefully, on your staff. I don't want to burden Marcella or staff, but I think it's worth their time and my time and your time to accomplish this goal here. So thank you for my opportunity. If you have any questions, I will stay online and will unmute so I see you have a question for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kent. And yeah, in this uh, particular case, um, if there are questions, uh, we'll definitely have a back and forth because this is an item brought forward by you. Um, so uh, Commissioner Patino. Yeah, my, my question, I've got two. One is how is mass transit gonna get its share out of this? That's uh, one. Instead of, you know, okay. is it all roads or, or is it gonna be divided so that we can actually save the transit system with it? That's one question and, and I'll, I'll wait for your answer. So, um, um, Kent, if you wouldn't mind to come back on, you've had a question, how is mass transit factor into this? As I understand it from your description, it doesn't. It's purely about paving and potholes, et cetera. But um, of course that uh, does uh, affect Paul. mass transit. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Paul, to answer your question, uh, what disqualifies you as far as a self-help municipality? And now the benefits of this not are only that we're going to use this tax for these specific purposes, but it also allows you, if, and have Marcella clarify this with you, it's my understanding of speaking to her, to get that extra carrot in all the other categories that have to do with transportation. So uh, there's all kinds of uh, matching funds out there. And this specific part would also be used for these projects, would free up some of the other municipalities and other entities' money to do the other projects you want to have. So it's, it's kind of a matter of possibly pushing around the money. That's left up to the latitude of you folks. But it's specifically dealing with this because this is what I feel we can market the best. Last time we hit the airport, we hit transportation, we hit trails, and it got very diversified. So thank you for the opportunity to answer that question. Okay. Thank and you. My, my I have a, the, my second question is, are you talking about a special tax or a general tax? Uh, Kent? 
Yes, uh, Paul, this is a special tax. It will take 66%. Uh, last time Measure U came out there, and it came just a little short. It came just a little short. It's equivalent in the city of Eureka. So I'm hoping that that little difference between us not being against a tax and being in favor will push it over that 66% limit. So it is a special tax specifically for these purposes, and that's what the taxpayers like to have. The general taxes, we're willing to support the other general taxes or consider that Eureka would be doing and all these other things also as long as they bring forward the same tax with the same sunsets and the same criteria. So we want to work with everybody as far as responsible taxes, and we feel this would be one. Okay, since, it's a, uh, since it's a special tax, if you don't specify transit in there, it, it can't be used for that. Well, I, I, I would say, Paul, get clarification from Marcella on that. These specific funds cannot be used for it, but again, uh, it does enable the funds that you are using from your general taxes or other tax revenue to be used for that. And it does get you the matching, the, the funds enabling you to get out into the, to the, to the free thing, moving up to you as far as getting additional funds. And in my, my opinion, that's more of the benefit possibly than the actual tax revenue uh, that's generated for this is to get you to that uh, being a self-help municipality or entity. And, and, and Gordon, you're going to have to ask, get clarification from Marcella on that. And those are some questions that I highly recommend you do ask at this time of Marcella. Thank you. Um, thank you. Next, yeah, I'm done. Next we time. have, thank you, Councilman Patino. Um, uh, Councilman um, Winkler, sorry. Mayor. All right. The one informational question and as part of this is, um, where do we stand as far as the grade of our roads in Humboldt County? I mean, we have an overall grade. We have grades within individual cities. And is there a, a goal for this tax on either arresting deterioration to a lower grade or being able to, to use this tax to get to a higher grade? Do we have any numbers on that of what our goals are if as a result of potentially enacting this tax? Okay, we're good. Sorry, Michael. Um, my inter internet connection suddenly went haywire, and I didn't hear everything. But I hope everybody else did. Did you? Can you maybe did repeat I, it, please? Oh, the, the question I had is that there is a uh, numeric grade for the roads in the county, both for individual cities and for uh, the unincorporated areas of the county. So my question is, where do we stand now? Which I'm sure you have information on. And is there a goal for this tax, or could there be a goal for this tax to either uh, arrest projected deterioration and, and hold it a certain grade, or to to get to a higher grade of roads within the county, and as a way of having uh, firm numeric goals for what this tax could potentially do, and data to back up uh, what it would be able to do? Okay, I can quickly address that if you'd like. Yes, please, Marcel. Um, yeah, so HCOG pays for studies every four years to get these grades and we go with the, the PCI, the Pavement Condition Index, and you're right, every city has a different number to give Trinidad's, I think is the highest. They only have nine miles of roads, so <laughs> good job, uh, Trinidad. Um, as an average for the whole county, we are on the slippery slope on the downside of the curve. I believe it's around 65, 66. I do see Tom Matson on this call, if he has a better number. There, it is projected to go downward. If there was more funding for fits, fixing potholes, then the number would go up. In terms of having a goal, there would have to be a lot of uh, uh, analysis, work with our technical advisory committee to uh, determine what is the realistic goal with $5,000. Each city in their reports that um, you know determined what their PCI was, there was a budget necessary to get them um, into the good condition. And I think, uh, you know, most cities were probably five or $10 million each. So the $5 million a year would help. Uh, I can't answer you right now how much that would help. And I see Tom is off of mute. So um, if that's okay with our chair, um, if Tom could speak. Uh, Director Matson. 
<clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the county's in the low 50s right now. And as stated, each city in, and the county are all different. And so the different amount of money is going to make a difference to each entity in a different way. <clears throat> For us, it's all about slowing down the rate of deterioration. SB1 gave us one third of what we need. We need an additional 10 million a year for the county just to maintain our current PCI. But <clears throat> 3 million to me is a lot different than 3 million to the city of Eureka because they have a lot less miles of road. So they would go <clears throat> a lot further in the city of Eureka to improving their roads or Arcata or Fortuna because you, they simply have so many fewer miles of road. So you would have to e ask each of the public direct works directors what a certain amount of money would do for their certain community. Um, for us, we would be looking to try to leverage additional funding to get to the point where we stabilize our road system and start to improvement, which is going to take a lot more than this, but you have to start somewhere. <clears throat> so it depends how you uh, uh, move through the formula. And as Kent stated earlier, he talked about a, a share between Eureka and the county. And my comment back to Kent was, if we're going to look at changing the shares, then we need to look at the original formula so that everybody is treated equitably, um, rather than just have a side agreement between the city of Eureka and the county. <clears throat> that agreement should be based on a formula that is equitable to all of us. So that's all I can add to this. Thank you. Thank you, Director Messon. I uh, hope you'll stick around in case there's other uh, issues that you might be able to clarify. Um, so, Councilmember West and then uh, Mayor Jones. Uh, we, of course, in Trinidad, we've got this very important tax coming up. So, this is a real strain on uh, the Trinidad people of Trinidad to have an extra quarter percent added on to what they already are going to be asking. We certainly would be frustrated to lose what we're trying to get up here because of this, even though as a biker, I absolutely agree that this is really important. I'm, I'm certain that it's gonna be really tough on uh, the past two taxes for Trinidad, so I'm, I'm worried about the conflict. Thank you, and then uh, Mary Jones. Yes, thank you, uh, Stel. So I spoke with Kent Sawatsky the other night about this, and I think one of the things I was looking at is politically, it sounds really good for us to be working with the Humboldt Taxpayer League. They have always been opponents of taxes. So when this came up from Kent, I was totally surprised by it. It was really taken back. But what I see is an opportunity now with us and this pandemic, which has brought people together in, in some ways, that we have a specific task with this tax. It's very specific. It's for potholes. It's for things that people can actually see and use in the county. And I feel for other cities that are trying to promote a tax at this time. But I, I'm really encouraged to see a group like the Humboldt Taxpayer League wanting to work with cities, seeing that we need money for potholes and, and specifically road maintenance. So I, I'd like to see maybe a, a, as little amount of time as Marcel would use on this item to come back with maybe a, a, some sort of a, um, an idea of how much it would cost for us to put this on the ballot. And if it's too late, I don't know because we won't be meeting until June now. So I, I don't know what our timeline is for getting it into this ballot. In four years, I think we can't, I can't, I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball to know what's going to happen in four years. I think it should happen in this year because with the pandemic, with the people feeling the way they are, to see something happen to their roads would be really helpful. Thank you, Mayor Jones. Mayor Seaman. Uh, Mike. Sorry, muted, yeah. Um, I also talked to Kent and, you know, as I'm sure like all of us was intrigued by the idea of the Taxpayers League wanting to support a tax. Um, and I was also intrigued with the idea of the self-help mun municipality. We're also looking for a tax in the city of Eureka that's absolutely crucial for us to get this year. Um, 
the more I researched it, the more all of our capacity is going to have to go towards pushing our tax. We couldn't help support this at all. I mean, we'd have to, and it could become competition. And I, I just feel like it is awfully late to start. Um, many of the same reasons that Marcella gave. Um, I, I think that for the city of Eureka, this is not right right now. For the city of Blue Lake, it, it would be right. And because there's not really a lot to lose if you don't have a tax there, but I'm, I'm very concerned about our tax and that's our priority right now. Thank you. What is your tax for, um, Susan? We have a sunsetting tax that's going out. Um, and we are, we're working to figure out what the exact details are right now, but we've been working on that for a while, um, exploring our options. And so um, it's not like something we're just putting together. It's something we've been working on for probably two years. Um, so it, it seems based on that, it, it, very difficult to just jump in right now and start planning a tax that would be successful. So um, any other comments, questions uh, on this item? Okay, uh, yes, uh, Council Member Johnson and then Council Member Patino. We also uh, are possibly looking, well, we already know we have a tax that's sunsetting in the future. And we were gonna be looking at how to best approach that. That was before the COVID crisis. And we're still not sure right now whether we're gonna move ahead this election cycle or wait. But this COVID situation has shown us the value of what we have and we want to make sure we hang on to it. So that's, I don't know how much or if we also could be a help or not at this point. And again, someone brought up tax fatigue. Um, each individual city has their own, but for a countywide measure on top of that, I don't know. Again, as has been brought up, this is a unique opportunity in that the Taxpayer League is on board, but each individual city and agency's residents are different, so. So, um, Council Member Patino, and then yeah. Council Member Smith. Okay. Thank you. Um, Arcata, we're considering, we are considering a tax on open space, a uh, special tax. So, we, uh, again, are somebody that will be in competition. Um, I also feel like the, our past experience with the, the countywide transportation tax was kind of rushed. It didn't come out well. I think that this is a time where we need to do something very sophisticated, and it's going to take years to prep for it. And so I, I personally feel 2024 with a really good specific tax that people can digest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, council Member Smith. Well, um, we just had a council meeting um, in Ferndale last night and discussed the possibility of um, some kind of sales tax. And um, the feeling was pretty strong that we have a, a school bond coming up, which is um, something that has been hanging fire for quite a long time. And the feeling, I think I can speak for the council here, uh, was, well, yes, we're going to have to uh, do something with a sales tax, but this is not the right time for Ferndale. Um, so that's what I have to tell you. Uh, Councilmember West. 
Yeah, I want to state again that you know we're could be in conflict. One of the big issues up here is when people want to buy large items like a car. And this a quarter percent tax is a lot of money. And I just, and I think this is going to be very difficult for all of us who are thinking of taxes. You're talking about a ten year tax, I believe. So that's going to affect affect us for a long time and make it difficult to do taxes within our cities. And I so I I um, find this to be very going to be very difficult. I although I agree with the idea, I think it's very difficult at this time, especially after COVID, when people are going to be losing jobs and there's not going to be a lot of money. So I'm I I don't see this being a good time. Um, did did I see your hand uh, earlier, uh, Councilmember Stein? Did you? Well, I just. Oh, you said about Riodel talking about a tax too. That's right. Yeah, and um, but I do feel that four years is a long time to let our roads degrade more. Uh, once they start degrading, it's it's difficult to. Uh, you know, recoup without really putting a lot of money into them. So I, that's just the other side of the coin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mayor Steeman. So there is no rule that says we can't do it in 2022. It's just- That's what I was thinking, yes. Yeah. Huh? That's what I was thinking too. Yeah. We don't so have to wait till the presidential year. We just need to start early and educate better in those years. Yeah, that 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 resonates. I I I don't think we need to go with any particular conventional wisdom because we're not in conventional times. Um, and I um, I would like to ask Director Masson if you wouldn't mind to explain a little bit for everybody the situation we're in with um, SB one funding. We have been allocated funding, and a lot of that will go for these kinds of things. Would you mind to address that a little bit, um, Director Matson? Um, thank you, Chair. I can try. The, okay. S the SB1 funding um, comes directly to cities and counties. Um, it will be reduced because of COVID, depending upon how, how much the transportation is reduced. Uh, it, we're already projecting a 10 to 15% reduction for next year uh, for our entire budget for the year based on probably a 40 to 50% uh, reduction in the monthly gas tax revenues starting next month. Um, it, uh, it does, it basically almost doubled the county's road maintenance budget. But again, we have the studies out there that show what our needs are. And as was brought up uh, by one of the other councilmen, uh, members, the longer you wait, the more it costs. So if if we repair something today in good shape for a dollar, if I wait 10 years, it'll be six to ten dollars. And so that is a very important uh, uh, point to focus on. Um, the, the SB1 funds, again, they're different for every community and every jurisdiction. I can only tell you what they did for our county. Um, they've helped out a lot. But like I said, it's only one third of what we really need to be investing annually into our road system just to maintain it at the PCI it is now because we are way down the slippery slope. We're not starting on the slippery slope in the county. We're hitting the bottom. Okay, well, uh, obviously this is um, a discussion that's brand new to us. And so, um, I'd like to kind of get a straw poll. I, I, I don't see, I, I see a bit of trepidation regarding this year. So I wanna get a sense. And, and what I would say, uh, first off, is, uh, echo what everybody says, it's absolutely wonderful to think that the Taxpayers League would, uh, would understand that these kinds of taxes actually help us. And, um, and so that's a, that's a plus. Um, one would hope that the taxpayers would, league would also support the other taxes that are being contemplated for that very same reason. And, um, and think a little bit along the lines of the concerns um, with regard to competition. Uh, because I've seen that happen in the past where uh, you have people go out and go, out, forget it, I'm not paying for any taxes. And we may get that anyway. I mean, that is a real 
thing that uh, that I see coming up as people's pockets books have been affected and uh, we're going in different directions. So I would like to get a feel from everybody. Uh, should we go at least to ask Marcella to come back to our next meeting with some figures based on our, our discussion today? Um, but then the other side of that is, will, will that delay it so that we'll basically repeat history like we did the last time we put a, a tax on and it failed. Um, and that was also, I think, because it was a last minute effort. So that gives me pause for sure. Um, so I'd like to hear it from you again, if you wouldn't mind, just give me a general feeling and I'll do, I'll look at my screen and I'll just go around that way. So um, Councilman Winker, your thoughts. No, it, it looks like under the circumstances with um, the extreme um, health and economic situation that we're in here and that it would have to be uh, rushed and couldn't be done in a thorough manner and marketed to the public that it seems like this is not the right time to do it, even though we desperately need it. And that we're all going to be operating off of under very tight budgets and having to, if anything, cut back our um, expenditures for uh, road maintenance and repair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember West. Sorry to act, try to go forward, but I got to get to my next meeting. So, but I. Okay. Uh, well, you're uh, right next to him on the on the right. screen. Good so. enough. Um, I'm gonna, uh, of course, I'm gonna say that that's too hard on Trinidad, and and I feel that that it's not a good time too. But I do think that two years would be an excellent idea. And I want to thank everybody. I got to go to the meeting, so I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember West. Um, so, Councilmember Patino. Yeah, I, I feel like actually, uh, I said 2024, but I really was thinking of 2022. And I think that that would be a great time. It, it gives us time to do it. It it's a, takes the pressure off the rest of us. I think it makes sense. And I think it's soon enough. Uh, Council Member Johnson. Well, I agree that 2022 would be good, seeing as how there's a lot of us looking at local measures. And as we've all found out this year, local measures are not completely protected because in, in the deferral, um, some of those, lo the local measures were folded into that what was deferred. It will come in, it'll just come in later and hopefully it helps out the small businesses that were able to take advantage of that. But uh, I think 2022 would give everyone an opportunity to lay a good foundation, get the message unified and in order, um, get the uh, public interest groups behind it and would give us time to have a good campaign for that. If, we're going, if it's going to get done, it needs to be done well. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Johnson, Councilmember Strand. Yes, I agree. 2022 would be perfect. It's a great idea. Thank you, Councilmember West um, and Smith. Um, I think that um, the situation in Ferndale um is that the school bond failed once because there was too short a time span spent on educating uh, the public and uh, giving them good reasons as to why the school tax was necessary um so they're trying again um, with better preparation. Um, but with that local issue looming very large, and because it concerns the children of the town, it really absorbs everybody's attention. So any other kind of tax 
um, no matter how well intentioned, would be, I think, for Ferndale, just um, wouldn't be heard well. So I like the idea of 2022 because at the council meeting, we were in pretty good um, agreement that a sales tax of some kind was going to be necessary in the fairly near future. Well, that would describe 2022 pretty well. It's not 2042. So um, I would say uh, no at the present, 2022 sounds good to me. Um, and I think I'm speaking for my fellow members. Thank you, Council Member Smith. And finally, Council Member Jones. I mean, Mayor Jones. Oh, uh, your mic. Mike. Okay, thank you. So you've already heard pretty much what I've said. I, I didn't know about all your other individual taxes. It seems like you're all working on your own thing. And I understand that. In Blue Lake, you're right. We are not working on something like that. For, so for us, this would be a good thing for us. Maybe we need to be working on our own tax. I don't know, that's for a discussion later for us. But um, I would be willing if, if we can still get the Humboldt Taxpayers League to be as excited about this in two years as they are now, I could see waiting as well. But I just wanna emphasize what an opportunity this is to finally get a group that has been dead set against any taxes ever to suddenly come forward and say, we need a tax, we're in trouble, help people. I, I think that opportunity is something we need to really consider. And I like what uh, uh, council member Strawn said about roads can't wait for four years. Uh, they, I guess they can wait for two and we'll see, but that those are my feelings about it. I'm willing to concede with the rest of everyone, but I do want to emphasize that this is an opportunity and we may not get it again. Uh, Council Member Johnson. I thank just, you, I just wanted to, to thank Ken Stowatsky for his uh, diligence and interest in this. And I heard him, I don't know, a couple of board of supervisors meetings ago, call in and talk about it. And I was pleasantly surprised. And um, I would just hope that our already being committed to something else at this point and not being able to get fully on board with it is not uh, off putting to him. But I am greatly appreciative of what he's done and hopefully we can keep moving forward in 22. Uh, nicely put Councilman um, Johnson. I, I would just add to that. Uh, I agree with, with you, um, it sounded very exciting. And, uh, it's great to have that level of cooperation and thinking outside the box. We need all the help we can get. And um, I, what I would say maybe is that for Mr. Sawatsky, what he's heard from this body is a genuine interest in following through with this idea, just not now. And I think that we could maybe even as a group commit to uh, giving it some um, attention, uh, giving it some time so that it's not a rush thing and, and, and really get behind the idea of this um, and the next possible election time, which would be 2022. I absolutely agree. We do not need to wait till 2024. Um, and so uh, I really appreciate the discussion. Um, I appreciate Mr. Swatsky bringing it forward. I, another thought that came to my mind is uh, the value of a, of a body like this, where I get to speak to representatives of each segment of the community in its own way. And what I hear is, it, you've got your finger on the pulse. I don't know that there would be a way to get a huge amount of 
voter support if you who have your fingers on the pulse know kind of how your town, town feels. So again, uh, a great idea. I really do think so. I think that uh, we should flesh it out and not let it not let it sit there until we get excited again. So let's start thinking about it pretty quickly and put it on a, a future agenda um, to discuss. Um, and I, I'd like to pass that message on to Marcella that maybe we, we agendize that, um, you know, maybe a few months from now and really get going on it or, or directly after the presidential election if we, don't want to be involved in another item at this time. So let's say in the uh, beginning of 2021, get going on it. So uh, thank uh, you. can I just add one thing? Absolutely. Yeah, we did fail pretty miserably last time. Yeah, uh, I know. 49%. And we did start about a year earlier, but we were on a tight budget. I think we only spent probably $200,000, which seems like a lot of out of our budget, but that's nothing for what needs to go in for a successful campaign. Um, and we cannot use state funding for any of that educational work. It all has to come out of our local funding, the local transportation fund. Um, so we, I mean, we just, we need to look at the budgets. Um, I can do things that won't spend a lot of my time. I can talk to other areas that are moving forward, ask them what their budgets are, uh, I do have ideas of, of what uh, we could have done better last time. So I can't put things together, talk to our technical advisory committee that won't cost a lot and then move it forward. We can still have the discussions, but in terms of spending a lot of significant time, which equals money and getting consultants, that'll be future considerations because it will affect our budget. But we can, we can certainly continue this conversation. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And um, again, I really do want to thank Kent for this and for and to the Taxpayers League uh, for bringing it forward. Uh, interesting times and interesting solutions. So I really appreciate that. I do want to say that just so everybody who's looking at their screen, a seaman, but we still have a quorum. So thanks again to, to everybody for your uh, discussion on this. And we'll go now to um, reconvene as the H call board. Um, so I'd like a motion in that regard, please. Make a motion. We reconvene, we close as the pack and reconvene as the H cog board of directors. Great. Um, and uh, I guess we need a second. I'll second that. Thank you. And go to Christy. Christy, can you do, uh, I don't really think we need a roll call vote for this, but uh, just to stay legal, I guess we'd better. So Christy, will you do a roll call on reconvening as the HCOG board, please? Yes. Councilmember Smith. Um, I have to be at another meeting at six o'clock. So I'm afraid I have to go. Can you, will you support the fact that we're going? Absolutely, we yes. Thank <laughs> you. By all means. Mayor Seaman. I think she left. She's absent. Yes. Council Member Strand. Yes. Mayor Jones. Yes. Mayor Winkler. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Yes. Supervisor Fennell. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And we still have a quorum, even with Council Member Smith gone. So let's go, um, go to uh, the HCOG staff and PAC members. Let's see. Any um, is the Caltrans report? Let's have the Caltrans report on 101, please. And uh, uh, Kevin, thanks for hanging in there with us. Yeah, hi everybody. The 101 project, currently the offsite Samoa wetland mitigation, uh, is being adver advertised, and that started on May 11th. The 2020 
State Transportation Improvement Program, approved additional funding for the Indian Indianola undercrossing project. The design is proceeding. And if you recall in some of the previous meetings mentioned that they're currently looking at six seasons for the construction. And so they're doing some additional work to see if they can reduce that. And so the target date to complete the design is January of 2021. And that's my update for that project. Thank you, Kevin. Any uh, questions uh, for Kevin? Okay. Um, do we, did, did you want to say anything about the HTA, Paul? Oh, no, not really. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so then the last item on the agenda is a report on the Eureka Arcata 101 Safety Corridor Supplemental Patrols. And we do have uh, some information on that. Marcella? Yeah, so this is the fun one of the day and I'll make it quick. Uh, EP, Eureka Police Department uh, suspended their supplemental patrols on March 18th due to the COVID-19 virus, uh, but they still uh, managed to put in 55.25 hours on patrol they logged 526 miles, 52 traffic stops, 13 citations, 39 warnings, and no arrests. The winners for March was a 35-year-old female from Huntington Beach, California, going 75 miles an hour in a 50-mile-an-hour zone. A 45-year-old uh, male from Arcata going 72, and a 19-year-old uh, year female from Arcata doing 71. Uh, they did not do uh, any patrols in April, so we won't have an April report, but as of last week, they began the May patrols. So we'll get some um, stats for May. Thank you, Marcella. I was expecting to hear about people speeding. There was a lot of that happening when there were very few cars on the road. And um, uh, Kevin, did you have something? Well, I just, um, item B, on the packer member, member reports i don't know if we wanted to do last chance grade. oh i i don't see that on there it's not on b. my agenda but yes it is oh, b. oh yeah yeah it's b sorry i heard d sorry kevin go ahead yeah no problem uh so the update for last chance grade the preliminary geotechnical investigations phase 2b is still on schedule drilling is expected to start in october of this year the coastal development permit application that was submitted to the County of Del Norte was conditionally approved. Environmental, environmental studies are currently ongoing. Uh, the Northern Spotted Owl studies began this year. All other environmental studies are planned for next year. An update on public engagement. The plan was for a public meeting this summer. They're still looking at summer or fall with potentially uh, an option for a virtual public meeting. And they are currently scheduling the next um, Congressman Huffman stakeholder group meeting that it, they're shooting for July for that meeting. And that's my update for last chance grade. So the, the Congressman Huffman meeting would probably be virtual or not? I mean, we don't know, I suppose. It doesn't mention it, but I imagine that um, they're, they're probably looking into that. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to tell at this point. I mean, everybody's kind of looking out that much further and saying we're probably going to have that just because the congregating will still be limited. But uh, we'll see how things go uh, here in Humboldt County as far as, and in Del Norte, as far as the reopening. Let's see. If there's more optimistic. Uh, I want to thank everybody very much for, uh, oh, please go ahead, council member, I mean, Mayor Jones. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Fennell. So on uh, May 30th, there's going to be an Annie and Mary rail trail groundbreaking at the museum. Now, due to COVID, it will not be one of those things where I can tell you to tell all your friends and come out. I wish I could but we'll be doing uh, physical distancing and, but we will be breaking ground at the museum um, in Blue Lake on May 30th. 
Saturday. And so we're pretty excited about that trail getting getting started here in Blue Lake, the yeah. Annie That's and Mary great. Rail Trail. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Anybody else got plans that we want to let? Oh, Una, go ahead. Let me, oh, okay. Um, so we're having a, a trail summit virtual on the first Saturday in June, June 6th from 9 to 11. Um, we're planning on having a video of the groundbreaking of the Annie and Mary. So if you can't make it in virtual non-person, come to the trail summit and Senator McGuire will be at the summit as well. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. So I think we've done everything. Um, really appreciate it again, as I said, a uh, very interesting discussion here. And thank you all, be well, and we will see you in June. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, bye. We everybody. are adjourned. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oops.